Hello and welcome again to Searching for Answers. My name is Carolyn Thompson and with me tonight is... John Jones, the HMS Richards Divinity School, La Sierra University. Ivan Blazin, School of Religion at uh, Loma Linda University. Bernard Taylor, Loma Linda, Loma Linda University Church. Okay. Well, we're all stumbling, <laughs> but uh, we'll try to do better. And well, that's uh, how Paul was doing in these Yes, words Paul was having doing. trouble too, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah. Oh, I feel right at home. Okay, I'm going to ask my dear friend, John Jones, to tell us where we are and where we're going to read. Well, I think we were, we were sort of groaning our way through <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> chapter 5 <laughs> of 2 Corinthians, yes. which is, um, which is a, a, a wonderful message. And uh, we, I think we were reflecting on the contrast between the present suffering yeah, in this life and the hereafter. So we had just taken a quick look uh, in chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians. Um, at the right of the opening paragraph there. So let's just go right back into that yeah. again and Good see what idea. we can do. Yeah. <clears throat> this is the revi New Revised Standard Version. We know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So what is he referring to right there? It's interesting that he's, he's interweaving two frames of reference. One is, uh, is housing, uh, a, a home. The other is clothing. Mm -hmm. And he kind of works those two yeah. together. And, he, and he's um, talking about his se himself. He's talking about he? himself. And if this each, body and each, of mine in my ministry is destroyed. That's right. Mm -hmm. And thus each uh, Christian <laughs> pilgrim as well. For he says in verse 2, In this tent we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, looking forward to the hereafter. If indeed, when we have taken it off, we will not be found naked. We're not altogether sure what to make of that one. I'll just say briefly, there are many early manuscripts that say, when we have put it on, we will not be found. I, I think the copyists, the photocopy machines didn't work very well in those days. They don't work real well today. But um, the, some copyists thought it made better sense to say, when we've taken it off. Some when we say, when we've put it on. The original is very similar. It's just from uh, en duo, which is our English word endow, comes mm -hmm. right from that, mm -hmm. or ek duo, change one letter, mm -hmm. whether you're off or on. Let me, let yeah. me read what my Bible says about it. Mm. Meanwhile, mm. While, we, while we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. Yeah. Oh, For so they, they yeah. take they yeah. take it on that way, the, other way. Right. the clothing, on the positive sense. For while we are in this tent, this earthly body, yeah. yes. we groan and are burdened because we do <clears throat> not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly yeah. dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Yeah. Does that explain it a little better? Well, that's better? pretty good. You can go one of two ways. See, when I read verse 3, I think of it as putting off this temporal groaning body that we have. If indeed, when we have taken it off, take off this body, we will not be found naked. That's the thing that Paul doesn't, and no Hebrew wants to be found, is naked mm -hmm. in a disembodied kind of state. And um, he wants embodiment and so on. So one way or the other, he's longing for the time when the heavenly, the heavenly uh, body, the heavenly tent will come. Bernard. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm inwardly groaning. Are you? <laughs> yeah, I just want our... Uh... I wondered if in verse 3 um, that when, when we have taken it off, uh, that there was the fear that it, that it may be found naked um, in a little different sense than you were understanding it, but now... Um, I hear what you were saying, but the, is this the transition from this life to the next life? I think so. That is in sight here? Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds to me like it uh, may well be that altogether. <clears throat> I might mention a word about the groaning. Um, one time, 
And Paul uses this in Romans 8, you know, where creation is groaning, we are groaning, everybody's groaning, even the Holy Spirit is groaning until that day when all things are complete. But I, I went, to, I had to go to the hospital here, the medical center, and I had a room there, and I had a roommate. And honestly, all night long, mm. this guy was in such pain that all he did was groan. And I said to myself, well, this doesn't feel very good. You know, there's no sleep tonight. But I kind of was appreciative for the fact that he was representing in his actions what Romans 8 and this text is talking about. Yes. Groaning. It represents the negative side of existence. Uh, you know, what are we doing? Just uh, when the pain is so great, we, we don't we always groan. give words. We just say, oh, yeah. you know, you can hardly stand the pain. And that's how Paul represents this life with its negatives and so on. He looks forward to the one, the tent which is to come. You know, Ivan, I think that Paul often in his preaching drew that contrast. Mm. He does it here in Second Corinthians. We groan, but the but the what's the eternal weight of glory, verse seventeen of the previous chapter, chapter four, is beyond all measure. Yeah. He uses almost the same word for word, same language Romans in eight. Romans 8, yeah. Yeah, verse 18. Yeah. The sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be yeah. revealed. I suspect he preached that way quite a bit. Well, that would make it what we call existential preaching, sure. connecting with people in their pain and in their suffering yeah. and, and so on. Existential meaning? Well, ex experiential personal experience, the way okay. we uh, perceive it. Um, I, if you don't mind a personal little notice, one time at a camp meeting in Northern California, I was giving a talk on Romans 8 and, and that business of suffering and groaning and, and so on. And I was talking about this groaning and so on. And there was a little lady, after the sermon was over, somehow the, the sermon seemed to have connected because we were talking about the kinds of things we actually go through here. So there was a little lady over here and uh, standing there with my first wife's sister. And she came forward to me and she said, um, your sermon meant a lot to me because six weeks ago mm. I just lost my husband, you know. He had a massive heart attack and that's how I got acquainted with my current wife. Those were the opening lines. I just lost my husband. He had a massive heart attack. And uh, boy, as she groaned. And of course, as you all know, uh, a little later on time, I married with her. And then right during our m first married week, both of her children were killed in a car crash. And I can assure you <laughs> that a lot of groaning went up. And uh, as you recall what Jesus mm -hmm. said on the cross, you know, he almost, I mean, it doesn't say he groaned, but I can picture him groaning. Why? Sure. Yeah. Oh, God, why have you forsaken me? Groan, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Why have been, I been left in the hands of these people who would kill me and take my life? Did Jesus, when he was on the cross, did he see through the final end? I don't think he did. Well, Ellen White says that he did in her book, Desire of Ages. Says he did not? Yeah, he did not see, she says, beyond the portals of the tomb. Nothing, nothing showed him for a time, uh, showed him himself as coming forth as a conqueror. Yes. So there was a period of absolute emptiness and darkness uh, for Jesus. And he was, he was miserable during that time. Just yeah. wondered, have I done enough? Have I fulfilled my father's promise to others, uh, am I going to make it? Uh, is everybody that I've talked to, that I've given hope to, are they going to be saved? Or have I somehow not made it plain? Oh. So I can imagine he went through terrible <coughs> agony right at the end. Well, it's been said, of course, that on the cross, he suffered, not the first death kind of experience, after which is resurrection, but the second death kind of experience, which we all deserve. And he experienced that like absolutely God 
forsaken. Now that is hell in the real sense of the term. Mm -hmm. To feel forsaken by God and alone, separate from God the Father, his Tur own Father. Turned his face from him. Yeah. It's, uh, I don't think we dwell on that enough to realize that Jesus really suffered not knowing whether he had completed the work that his father asked him to do. Well, the resurrection is sort of the, isn't it, the vindication of that work. Yes. <coughs> Absolutely. Okay, where are we now? And let's go on. Okay, are well, we in five we're, we're in five, yeah. We, we, we've talked about this groaning and so on, we, and he didn't want to be further unclothed, but clothed. And then we come to that wonderful verse, he who is, well, he says, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. And he who has prepared us for this, for this life, um, has given us the spirit as a guarantee. And that's a very colorful word, as my colleagues mm -hmm. know. The guarantee, the down payment. We've got the first installment of what is to come. Because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, in other words, the, the way that we have our skin now, we mm -hmm. groan mm -hmm. and are burdened because we do not wish to be enclosed, but mm -hmm. to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. Mm -hmm. so, he that what is, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose and has given us the spirit as a deposit. Did you get that? Yeah, a deposit guaranteeing yeah. what is to come. They have both those words as a deposit guaranteeing. Uh -huh. that's, that's very well done. That captures the idea very, yeah. very well. So people, I think this is a good verse to sh uh, share with people who think, oh, I don't stand a chance. I'm never going to make it. After all, I've done this and this and this. They are going to make it. They got a guarantee. They got a guarantee. <laughs> Just like when you buy a new car, do you get a guarantee? Yes, you should. And that's, yeah. the, that's the contract. It's yeah. not holding off to see. Exactly. But the contract is already signed. The deposit is made. Yeah, that's mm. right. To go back is to break the contract. Exactly. God, God is committed. He has Absolutely. committed. Yeah. Yeah. And even though uh, people get discouraged and think, oh, I didn't mean to say that or do that. I'm never going to make it. God says, don't talk like that. You're going to make it because I've been there. Yes. There is a verse that you could uh, see as a parallel to this. Uh, it doesn't use the word guarantee, but I think the essential thought behind it, and, and I think it's Romans 8.11. If you take a look at that, uh, this may add a little further nuance. Um, chapter 8 of Romans, mm -hmm. Romans 8.11. Mm -hmm. um, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through the spirit that dwells in you. We get a new tent. Yes, we have. Yeah, that's right. New life, new tent. Paul, uh, Paul didn't want to die before Christ came. He wanted no. to live he wanted until to Christ live. Come. Um, But didn't Jesus appear to him in the flesh? Well, on the road to Damascus, yeah. he certainly, by his own testimony, saw the risen Christ. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, he says that he did. And he says in, in 1 Corinthians 8, 1, am I not an apostle? Haven't I seen the Lord? That's right. You remember that? To be an apostle, you had to have seen Jesus. Right, absolutely. So Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and home with the Lord. <laughs> so we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Yeah. Does that give you... 
Well, the only thing that gives people pause in this passage is those who say, now, wait a minute. Uh, he says in verse uh, 8, we would uh, rather be away from the body and, and be at home with the Lord. Then that would sound, it so has sounded to some people like that's the disembodied state. But he just got done saying, we don't want to be disembodied. We That's don't right. want to be naked. In chapter 4, you know, 14, he, he talked uh, mm. about the resurrection from the dead. So uh, when, when it says we would rather be away from the body, from this kind of body, you know, at home with the Lord, with the new body. But it also sounds in uh, verse 10 that he's a little bit concerned. Uh, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. So he's not saying everybody's going to have a new body. He's going to say, we have to go through a little judging mm, here. Yes. See? Well, yes. isn't that kind of verse 10 an explanation of verse 9? We make it our yeah. aim mm -hmm. to please him. And one thing we know is that our lives are oriented to him and there will be a judgment. Yes. In a way, you know, Paul is kind of relativizing the whole question of whether he's going to live until the second advent or not. Mm -hmm. Both in verse 6 and in verse 9 we see the same language. Whether we're at home or away, you know, which kind of means things are going to work out according to the divine plan, including the judgment to be sure. You don't escape mm. the judgment by living until the second advent or by dying before the second advent. It doesn't yeah. matter. Here, there, we all must appear. But nonetheless, we have confidence. Yes. That's Isn't good. that interesting? Yes. That's, yeah. that's, that's, that's preachable. That's, that's good. what drew me yeah, to that. Yeah. In, in spite yeah. of all of this, and yeah. in a sense because of all of this, yeah. because this is what it has taken to get these converts to where they are, we're confident. Paul was not somebody who was, was tentative, to use the word I used before, but he believed that he was called, he had a divine calling, and the Spirit was with him and would work with these people. It was his role to be persistent. And I wondered if in verse 10 this was much mm. less about Paul, but rather about uh, his readers uh, right. to know that there is a consequence. Yes. Yeah. And so there will be a judgment, yes. and it will not pass unnoticed if you continue on the path that you're on. And, yeah. and what right. fits with that, Bernard, is <clears throat> you can make a strong argument for the fact that these people denied the future resurrection of the body because they believed that they had already been resurrected in their inner self right now. They're reigning on high. They don't need mm. what's coming in the future. And so therefore, since they have already sort of made it, they can sort of do whatever they wish. It doesn't really mm. matter. Yes. He says, well, we make it our aim to please the Lord. We don't do everything, uh, any, th any old thing. You know, you have those statements. All things are lawful in 1 Corinthians. It yes. appears a number of times. Yes. They were saying that, not Paul. Everything's lawful now. Everything's right? ours. <laughs> it's ours. Yeah, yeah. It belongs yeah. to us. I thought when yeah. you ask forgiveness for a sin, you wouldn't have to go through the judgment and face that again. That doesn't mm. say that here. No. Uh, well, you don't have to go through a judgment of condemnation, though. For we it must all appear before yeah. the judgment seat of Christ. All right, yeah. then let me... Let me uh, Read you another text. That each text. one okay. doesn't say no, but <laughs> that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while right. in the body, right. whether good or bad. Yeah. Scary. Well, no. the judgment is scary. No. no, no, not at all. The judgment is vindication. What about what do you say? See, I have two <laughs> here that don't agree with me. It's not well, we scary. We agree in part. We know where you are in that. What you're saying. There's a story of two rabbis, a big one and a little one, who were disagreeing with each other. And they couldn't settle the great heavy theological issue. So they said, well, finally, let's ask the voice on high, who is right. And there's a thunder and a hand points down to the big one and says, he's right. Whereupon the little one then says, okay, so now it's two against one. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Moving right along. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Oh, no, my. No, I, I think you're right. That it, is a it, very comforting thing. <laughs> it is, a, it is a vindication. But Paul is, you know, the reason he puts this serious note in here, he's trying to sober these people up. Mm, right. And they need it. Yes. So. To give them a sense of eternal consequences. That's right. So he's twisting the knife blade a little here. Yeah. The idea of pleasing God, I mean, that, that is a prominent thing in Paul. And I, I like that idea. You know, we can say, well, keep the law and follow the commandments. But Paul likes to talk about pleasing God. And I'm just going to read you one text on that that came into my mind here. First Thessalonians 4, which also talks about the coming of the, re the Lord and all that and the resurrection. Finally, brothers and sisters, we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you learn from us how you ought to live and to please God, which you are doing, do it more and more. He, uh, the apostles taught the converts how to please God. I like that rather than just saying how to follow the law, even though the law you'll want to follow, how to please God, you know? Why do we have to go through the judgment if we're pleasing God? Well, as I say, the, it's not a judgment of condemnation. It's a judgment of approval. All, the Hebrews look forward to judgment oh, all the yes. time because God the <coughs> judge is just, and he will, when they have been knocked down, he's going to restore them. He'll vindicate them. He'll vindicate them. That's the point. So judgment is very good, I think. <coughs> why, why would we worry about the judgment if we have salvation in Christ? Do we know? That we yes, have we do. How do we know we're well, accepted? Well, all right. Carolyn, every once in a while we go through this. Mm -hmm. And so we, we need to quote a verse. We, never, we need to quote a verse. Well, I think some of our listeners have those same questions. Oh, they do. We have them now and again. Where are you going? 1 John 5, 9. <coughs> Following. That's on your question, even though it's not 2 Corinthians. <laughs> it, it does bring out a point that we're bringing out. First, uh, first, uh, first John, John 5, verse five, 9. Verse 9. Yeah. Okay. If we receive human testimony, and the assumption is that we do receive human testimony, we, we believe people, teachers, used car salesmen, and so on, <laughs> for this is the testimony of God that he's testified to his son, now, those who believe in the Son of God have the testimony, God's testimony, yes. in their hearts. Those who do not believe in God have made him a liar. If you don't believe whatever this testimony is, you're making God a liar. You're saying, God, you're a liar. By not believing in the testimony that God has given concerning his Son. So you, you say to yourself, well, what is the testimony? And this is the testimony. God gave us eternal life. This life is in the Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. <coughs> I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may <coughs> know that you have eternal life. Beautiful. Yeah. Let's say again where that can be found. for First John, our First John 5, verses 9 through 13. First John 5, verses 9 13. It's one of the great You're going to come through the judgment just fine. That's right. That's right. And <coughs> Paul is not too far from that in the next verse in, first, in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 11. Therefore, yeah. knowing the fear of the Lord, we try to persuade others, but we ourselves are well known to God, and I hope that we are also well known to your consciences. Yes. Mm. Not to you, but to your conscience. Right. Yeah. Consider <laughs> what we are saying. Yes, yes, yes. That's good, Bernard. Well, then goes back to this <laughs> yeah. co commending <laughs> business again. Where, where are verse we now? Verse 12. First In uh, what second, chapter? Uh, the fifth chapter. Verse 12. Verse 12. Okay. Um, shall I read it? Sure. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you an opportunity to boast about us <coughs> so that you may be able, and that has a practical application, mm. so that you may be able to answer those who boast in outward mm. appearance mm. and not in the heart. Uh, Paul's kind of a lesson, and um, <coughs> the Corinthians are supposed to take that lesson and uh, give a lesson to others who, you know, boast on outward appearance. You know, like they said of him, he doesn't have a good outward appearance. We We're want strong apostle. For Christ's love compels us 
because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died and he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. One of the great now can you just un uh, uh, unwind that for me? Well, you were quoting verse 14, right? Yes. Uh, we, maybe one of my colleagues wants to speak on that. Uh, for the love of Christ, that's Christ's love for us, not our love yes. for him. We live by faith. Yeah. And in the King James Version, it says, for the love of Christ constrains us. Yes. And some people have wondered what that meant. What does constrain mean? It always mean? sounded like it was holding back. Yes. It's like it's restrain. Yes. It's not restrain, no. but constrain. That to constrain you is to put you on a pathway moving forward. Yeah. yeah. New Revised Standard says, urges us on. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. 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 See? That's that impels good. us. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Impels, propels, compels, compels, <laughs> all these <laughs> those interesting <laughs> words there. Yeah, because we're convinced. Okay, it, the, it's the love of Christ that propels us on in our Christian life. Okay, right. so now there's point number one. Because we're convinced that one has died for all, he's died for all of us. Therefore, in his death, we all died. Mm -hmm. Whatever sins do was, it got it in his death. Have died, not might die. Mm -hmm. Right. Would oh. you say that God is doing everything he can to get us to heaven, not keep us out? Absolutely. Well said. Can I preach that in church? Sure. <laughs> All right. I want to want to preach it. Okay, we have about 12 seconds left, and I'm going to ask John Jones to finish up in 7 seconds. <laughs> We work with God to save as many as possible through Beautiful. Him. Beautiful. Okay. 